I want to talk to you about seven, everything's in sevens as, as much as possible. Easy for you to teach and remember, enough to be persuasive and convincing. The name of this, seven master keys to living in financial peace. Seven master keys to living in financial peace. Conferences like this are designed and focused on birthing in you enthusiasm, energy, and focus for financial increase. That's the purpose of this conference. The downside is you can have a turbulence arise in you that makes you unhappy with where you are makes you discontented and restless and unsatisfied with what God's given you. That's the downside. You know, they say you take this medicine, it'll cure your headache, but it'll give you a stomachache. <laughs> so transfer the pain. <laughs> In fact, sometimes when they advertise medicine on TV, the, lo the list, <laughs> side effects, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> side effects, you know, you'll lose both arms in three months and lose an eye in two weeks. <laughs> well, why am I taking this medicine? The downside of a conference, and I always think of the, I'm always thinking of the downside. How can I improve this conference? Last night I was thinking, because um, when you totally focus on financial freedom and financial increase, when you totally focus on that, something has to be neglected. It has to be. There's things you cannot cover. I have people come up and say, you didn't say anything. My transcriber, and she'll get a hold of this because she'll transcribe this, called me the other day and I was dictating a whole bunch of paragraph descriptions of all my CDs. And she said, and it was my paragraph on the altar call. She said, you didn't say one word about Jesus in that description paragraph. You left him totally out of the paragraph. I said, I think I left the Antichrist out too, didn't I? <laughs> and she starts saying, don't you know that Jesus is the most important? Well, we, we, yeah, I do. I said, then put his name in there where you think it ought to go. <laughs> 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 I was trying to describe something about the altar call and uh, she was upset because I didn't mention the name Jesus in the paragraph there will always be something left neglected it's the downside of totally focusing so it's important that you value peace above prosperity don't forsake peace to embrace prosperity. It's possible to be a millionaire and be miserable. It is possible. It's possible to have more money than you can shake a stick at and can't sleep at night. It's possible. It's possible. So we talk about financial peace. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the law of God applied accurately. Wisdom is the scriptural solution to an earthly problem. Wisdom is the ability to discern right from wrong. I do know people that have gone to church, lived for God, stood, sat on the front seat, and when God began to bless their business, they went to the middle, then they went to the back, and eventually they left out Thursday nights, and eventually they stopped Sunday nights, and eventually their business was so successful they didn't have time to go to church. That was God's greatest concern in, in Deuter uh, Deuteronomy 8. He said, be careful if I begin to bless you that you forget where it all came from, that you forget. Some churches with an emphasis on financial prosperity have brought great grief to my spirit. When I walked in the church, it was about gold and silver and diamonds and Rolls Royces, and Jesus was not there. The greatest danger of those who discover the financial anointing and blessing is it replacing your focus on the Holy Spirit. 
How can you, seven keys to living in financial peace. I mean living there, not visiting it, but living in financial peace. Number one, make God or view God as your focus, as your only true source of every good thing. Make God your focus. View God as the only true source of every good thing. Psalms 84 verse 11, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He is a giver. He is the giver. He uses channels and different sources. He uses different people as sources of blessing or as channels of blessing, but he's your source. Why do I ask you to focus on that? I ask you to focus on that because it will not be your rent houses that keep you in retirement. It'll be God. Somebody can fall in your rent house and sue you for everything you've got and win through a prejudiced judge. All it takes to destroy you is one judge who doesn't like you. I have a minister friend who made a mistake and a young teenage girl reported it 10 years later and he got 47 years in prison. All it takes is one prejudiced person against you. That's all it takes. You are one person away from wipeout every day of your life. You reach in the back seat of your car. Your eyes are off the road. You hit manslaughter, 10 years in prison. You cannot make yourself the source of all the things in your life. There's only one. Make God your true source. He's the source of your protection. He's the source of your ideas. Why do I tell you that this is the only, that's the first master key to living in perpetual financial peace? May I never have what God doesn't give me. I don't want anything God doesn't give me. You say, well, God won't let you have anything you don't. Oh, no, yeah, he will. Oh, yeah. God will give you what, God will give you what he don't want you to have. You're kidding. He did to Israel. He said, I want you to be under Samuel. No, we want a king. That's what you want. That's what you get. There's a downside to it. Why should you make God your focus? It's the only way to stay in perpetual expectation. I go through some real seasons of disappointment. I share some of them so that people can know that you too have overcome and you know where they're feeling. Sometimes when I get out of a service I say, really, maybe I shouldn't have told them what I, I, maybe that looks like I've got a steel chip on my shoulder. Maybe I should tell them only the good, fun, wonderful things and not tell them any of the negative. But then you'll think something's wrong with your life when you hit a, va a valley. <laughs> if I only tell you about my mountains, you'll think, Lord, my life must not be together. But valleys is part of the life. It's part of the journey. If you make God the source of every good thing. Your friendships won't get perverted, deceptive, and personal agenda. Do you follow that? It'll be a whole different world. Because you'll only nurture relationships where you perceive a possible improvement to your life. You won't pursue a relationship for loss. You'll pursue it for gain. And if you believe that God is your source, that's the relationship you will nurture. See, if I believe you're my source, then I'll be, uh, my warmth to you won't even be genuine. My congeniality won't even be pure. If I think my future's in your back pocket or your checkbook, that's going to mess up our friendship. You know that. It's the downside of being blessed. And just let me tell you right off, when you're blessed, you live in constant sensitivity that somebody only likes you for what they can get out of you. Every wealthy man knows that. I'm not wealthy, per se. I think you've got to be worth $10 million to be wealthy or something. Isn't that $10 million? Is that what they consider wealthy? $10 million. 
Uh, so I'm not there yet. I think, I think if you nurture God being your source, God is my source, you'll, you will live in perpetual expectation because of his character. But if you believe people owe you something, you will live in perpetual disappointment because they will not come through. They cannot come through for you. Our ministers are going to the main service and start, you there at your house, we're going to stay focused here on this for a few minutes till we finish this. Make God your total focus. Make God your, your true source. Not your rent houses. That's a method God uses. Not your real estate, though we perpetuate that. Not even a debt-free house. There's people that's lost everything they had in a day. God is my source. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you know what? See yourself, and this is, this is uh, number two. See yourself as a steward over his properties. See yourself as a steward, not as an owner. View yourself as an overseer of God's properties. You don't own it. You'll leave it all right here. While I'm here, this is the turf he's given me. What will I do? I'll protect it, raise it to its highest level of excellence, and increase it for those who come after me. Because you'll want to bless somebody. You'll start looking pretty soon for somebody to leave some of it to. Who do I need to leave it to? Who do I need to bless? What do I need to do? Some say, well, I hadn't got there yet. I'm trying to bless myself. But it's important for you to see yourself as a steward. Father, this is what you've given me. And you said if I walk in the light I have, you'll give me more light. You said if I use the talent I've got, you'll add to my talents. God is the God of increase. He loves the pleasure of increase. He loves that. It comes through believing him. If you're going to be a steward, you, you, you make different decisions. Why do you need to view yourself as a steward? Ownership is addictive, and it's impossible to satisfy. Stewardship can live satisfied, contented, but not ownership. You can't get enough. How do we know that? Solomon said the eyes of a man are never satisfied. He said a rich man wants more. They asked a wealthy man, I think it was John D. Rockefeller, how much does it take to be ha how much money does it take to be happy? He said, just a little more. <laughs> just a little more. If you see yourself as owning everything that you have, this is mine. This belongs to me. You will get clutchy. You will get overly protective. Uh, it'll mess your head up. You'll believe that uh, also it'll increase, your, it'll increase the stress on your life. You'll feel, you'll feel stress like it's up to you to protect and keep, take care of it. And watch over. But if you say, I'm a steward, God, I have your aid. I, I have your help. I have your aid. I can't do this without you. You gave it to me to oversee while I'm on the earth. I will look over them. My mother used to tell me, said, I gave you to God. God will get you. I gave you to God. Three, if you're going to live in financial peace, you must allow others to be accountable for their own financial decisions and mistakes. If you're going to live in financial peace, you must allow others around you to be accountable for their own financial decisions and mistakes. You can underwrite everybody who fails. If your son bought a house he couldn't afford, don't bail him out. Let him taste the reward of failure, which is discovery. Humility is one of the benefits of failure. <laughs> failure makes you, increases your caution. Failure makes you more uh, receptive to counsel, correction. John Kluge, the billionaire, said, I've learned more from my failures than I have my successes. You must allow people to suffer. You must. 
it's one of God's tools. You're kidding. No. One of my young protégés, I said, son, you can't afford a house more than 125000 If I were you, would stay with 100000 because you'll need money for taxes, insurance. You'll need money for your wife's clothes. You'll need money for furniture. But like 90% of them went right out and bought a hundred, I think it was about a hundred and forty, hundred forty-five, hundred fifty thousand dollar house. Didn't you have the down payment? And uh, he said, "Would you buy the house?" I said, "Well," and let me buy it back from you. I said, "Well, all right." So I gave him a large down payment, and when he got to the place to do it, he decided he wanted the house himself, so he used the down payment for his own buying the house. So it, it turned him to a liar and a deceiver immediately, and I had to face and deal with him on that. And uh, he's still indebted to me, obviously. And uh, I say that to say uh, he needed a hurt. He needed a hurt. If you make a mistake, you're supposed to hurt. Someone close to me and related to me that I love very much, Colin was upset. I just need help. I just need help. I said, are you tithing? Well, no. I said, then you're supposed to be hurting. That's a scriptural thing. I won't give life to something God's killing. You've got to be an idiot to underwrite a non-tither. Don't you think that ought to be on every questionnaire for benevolence? Show us a photograph of your last tithe check. <laughs> Make sure I'm not trying to sponsor something God hates. Don't want to get on his bad side. If you harbor a fugitive, we'll treat you the same. That's President George W. Bush. Allow people to pay. If you don't, you'll feel guilty for your blessing. You'll feel guilty for having when they don't. You'll feel guilty for being the trophy on display at your house. See, men, I do believe probably, I don't think all of us, by the law of averages, I don't have faith for everybody, but I, I think there's a good good chance that about 20 to 25% of the men of the church will become millionaires. There's a solid chance of that. There's a solid chance. Why? It'll become your focus. You'll become creative. You'll be a magnet for millionaire ideas. That's, that's going to be important. And now that you have a legitimate scriptural reason for pursuing such, you, you, this thing can get in your spirit. and you'll be, you'll, you, Because what you believe decides what you see. Don't feel guilty for being blessed and others not blessed. Everybody is a hostage to their belief system. They won't change their beliefs until it won't produce something they need. And some people are poor because that is the product of their belief system. India, they'll drag around an old skinny cow that they think is one of their gods and starve to death and every morning pick up dead bodies in the streets on a wagon. I know I've been there. Rush in, touch the blood of a, of a goat, touch it on the head as, a, as some kind of religious ritual. I want to tell you something. You have to pay the price for wrong thinking and wrong beliefs or you won't change them. If, there, if there's no loss experienced through embracing a lie, what would be the reward for embracing the truth? And let me say a wisdom key that I say over and over because I've had to deal with this. Now, I do have relatives that cannot one particular, someone I love very much, that cannot mentally, emotionally, physically, cannot produce for themselves. And I give them through my sister, uh, Deborah, I give them a check every week. And I underwrite their life. That's one of the rewards of being a blessing. People that cannot take care of themselves, but they're under your care. They're, to me, they're part of our stewardship. But there are people who will not believe anything you say, reject every piece of advice you have. And let me say a wisdom key, you are not responsible for the pain in those who have decided to ignore your counsel. You are not responsible for the pain in those who ignore your counsel. Pastor, when you go back to your church in Africa, every one of your ministers have to use their faith for their income. You'll pay them a decent amount, what's fair, because the Bible says a, a, you know, a servant's worthy of his hire. You'll pay them a decent amount, 
for what they do. But it's really important for you to let them use their own faith. Let them use their faith for their, you're not their God. You're not their Jehovah Jireh. You're not the source of their harvest. My staff has to see that. I'm not responsible for their bills. If they get a ticket speeding, I'm not responsible for paying that ticket. If they buy a house they can't afford, I'm not responsible to pay that house note. How many understand that? Don't you take that burden on yourself. If you're going to live in financial peace, you must let every man bear his own burden. Do you need scripture on that? You already know that. Look at someone next to you and say, I'm going to make you bear your own burden. This is Galatians 6, Galatians 6, 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. It looks contrary to number two, bear you one another's burdens. But you must see where it fulfills that. It's Galatians 6, verse 4, 5 verses. Let people carry their load. Let people carry their load. Four. If you're going to live in financial peace, are we on number four? You must embrace the divine law of process. You must accept and embrace the divine law of process. Seed, time, and harvest. Lamentation of God goods those that wait on him. Waiting is proof of trust. There is a great emphasis on the law of process in Scripture. Here a little and there a little. In due season you will reap if you faint not. There is a process to this blessing. I have read that 98% of lottery winners are bankrupt within 24 months because you can rarely protect and keep what you didn't birth. A little chicken inside the egg pecks and pecks and pecks. Remember the little boy who said he wanted to help the little chicken so he broke the egg open? And because the little chicken was not strong enough, it died. Because in the law of process, God had arranged that when that little chicken began to peck that egg, it developed its muscle and strength so that it could survive in an adversarial environment. The law of process is making you militant in protection. It's placing a value. Donald Trump paid his son $5 a week for years. That was his allowance. He said, I want my son to understand the value of money because it didn't come easy. If you're going to live in financial peace, you must accept the process as part of a divine law. You're learning, you're gaining, you're becoming. Mm, so much I want to say about that. Let me, in fact, I want, I want to. I want to go back to that for a moment. We've got just a few moments. You don't have today everything God's going to give you. There's a process. If you can't handle $10 right, why are you trying to get 100 Let's work because what you do with a dollar is what you do with 100 If you tri trivialize a dollar, you'll trivialize 100 Have you learned how to handle what God has given you? Have you learned how to protect it? Can you turn 100 to 125? If I gave you a $100 bill, every one of you, a $100 bill today, I'd say, come back next week and tell me what you did with it. Would you come back with more? I think it ought to be with the benevolence requirement. I'm going to give you $200. I want you to come back next Monday and show me what you made with it. Wouldn't that be something? Mike, is that like God? That's exactly like God. <laughs> Remember those talents he distributed? And one guy didn't. 
He didn't lose it, but he didn't gain. And God was so angry over it, he took the one talent he had and gave it to a guy that was productive. If you're going to live in financial peace, in my, in my opinion, you should live within the salary you're making. Live on the salary you're making. Don't live on the salary you want to make. And when you go, when you buy on credit, you're living on the salary you hope to make. You're counting on tomorrow's income. Why should you live on the salary that you're making? And I would say try to live on 70%, 10% to God, 10% for your savings, 10% for investing. And uh, I, would, I, would, I would try to live on, seven, on, on 70 cents out of the dollar. And that's how the dollar that you're getting, you know, you're already getting the government about 25 or 35% or 40%. But try to live on the salary that you're making. Have the courage to downsize. Have the courage to downsize. My wife doesn't want to give up this house, but you can't afford it. If both of you work in 10, 12 hours a day, you have no time to enjoy life. You have no extra money to, to go on a vacation. You're living above your means. That's what the famous saying, but it is. Have the courage to downsize to your present salary. Why? When you live on credit, you're creating an illusion for yourself. You're living a falsehood. You're really living a falsehood. And, and you're living a lie. You're deceiving yourself. And it's not the real world. It's not the real life for yourself. And if you, gotta, you, know, if you just have to lie, don't lie to yourself. If you just have to lie, don't lie to you. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? So thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch 
God move. One of my young protégés, I said, son, you can't afford a house more than 125000 If I were you, you'd stay with 100000 because you'll need money for taxes, insurance. You'll need money for your wife's clothes. You'll need money for furniture. But like 90% of them went right out and bought a hundred, I think it was about a hundred and forty, hundred forty-five, hundred fifty thousand dollar house. Didn't even have the down payment. And uh, he said, "Would you buy the house?" I said, "Well," and let me buy it back from you. I said, "Well, all right." So I gave him a large down payment. And when he got to the place to do it, he decided he wanted the house himself, so he used the down payment for his own buying the house. So it, it turned him to a liar and a deceiver immediately, and I had to face and deal with him on that. And uh, he's still indebted to me, obviously. And uh, I say that to say uh, he needed a hurt. He needed a hurt. If you make a mistake, you're supposed to hurt. Someone close to me and related to me that I love very much, Colin was upset. I just need help. I just need help. I said, are you tithing? Well, no. I said, then you're supposed to be hurting. That's a scriptural thing. I won't give life to some God's killing. You got to be an idiot to underwrite a non-tither. Don't you think that ought to be on every questionnaire for benevolence? Show us a photograph of your last tithe check. <laughs> Make sure I'm not trying to sponsor something God hates. Don't want to get on his bad side. If you harbor a fugitive, we'll treat you the same. That's President George W. Bush. Allow people to pay. If you don't, you'll feel guilty for your blessing. You'll feel guilty for having when they don't. You'll feel guilty for being the trophy on display at your house. See, men, I do believe probably, I don't think all of us, by the law of averages, I don't have faith for everybody, but I, th I think there's a good good chance that about 20 to 25% of the men of the church will become millionaires. There's a solid chance of that. There's a solid chance. Why? It'll become your focus. You'll become creative. You'll be a magnet for millionaire ideas. That's, that's going to be important. And now that you have a legitimate scriptural reason for pursuing such, you, you, this thing can get in your spirit and you'll, 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 because what you believe decides what you see. Don't feel guilty for being blessed and others not blessed. Everybody is a hostage to their belief system. They won't change their beliefs until it won't produce something they need. And some people are poor because that is the product of their belief system. India, they'll drag around an old skinny cow that they think is one of their gods and starve to death and every morning pick up dead bodies in the streets on a wagon. I know I've been there. Rush in, touch the blood of a, of a goat, touch it on the head as, a, as some kind of religious ritual. I want to tell you something. You have to pay the price for wrong thinking and wrong beliefs or you won't change them. If, there, if there's no loss experienced through embracing a lie, what would be the reward for embracing the truth? And let me say a wisdom key that I say over and over because I've had to deal with this. Now, I do have relatives that cannot, one particular, someone I love very much, that cannot mentally, emotionally, physically cannot produce for themselves. And I give them through my sister, uh, Deborah, I give them a check every week and I underwrite their life. That's one of the rewards of being a blessing. People that cannot take care of themselves, but they're under your care. They're, to me, they're part of our stewardship. But there are people who will not believe anything you say, reject every piece of advice you have. And let me say a wisdom key. You are not responsible for the pain in those who have decided to ignore your counsel. You are not responsible for the pain in those who ignore your counsel. Pastor, when you go back to your church in Africa, every one of your ministers have to use their faith for their income. You'll pay them a decent amount, what's fair, because the Bible says a, a, you know, a servant's worthy of his hire. 
you'll pay them a decent amount for what they do. But it's really important for you to let them use their own faith. Let them use their faith for their, you're not their God. You're not their Jehovah Jireh. You're not the source of their harvest. My staff has to see that. I'm not responsible for their bills. If they get a ticket speeding, I'm not responsible for paying that ticket. If they buy a house they can't afford, I'm not responsible to pay that house note. How many understand that? Amen. Don't you take that burden on yourself. If you're going to live in financial peace, you must let every man bear his own burden. Do you need scripture on that? You already know that. Look at someone next to you and say, I'm going to make you bear your own burden. This is Galatians 6. Galatians 6, 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. It looks contrary to number two, bear you one another's burdens. But you must see where it fulfills that. It's Galatians 6, verse 4, 5 verses. Let people carry their load. Let people carry their load. Four. If you're going to live in financial peace, are we on number four? You must embrace the divine law of process. You must accept and embrace the divine law of process. Seed, time, and harvest. Lamentation of God goods those that wait on him. Waiting is proof of trust. There is a great emphasis on the law of process in Scripture. Here a little and there a little. In due season you will reap if you faint not. There's a process to this blessing. I have read that 98% of lottery winners are bankrupt within 24 months because you can rarely protect and keep what you didn't birth. A little chicken inside the egg pecks and pecks and pecks. Remember the little boy who said he wanted to help the little chicken so he broke the egg open? And because the little chicken was not strong enough, it died. Because in the law of process, God had arranged that when that little chicken began to peck that egg, it developed its muscle and strength so that it could survive in an adversarial environment. The law of process is making you militant in protection. It's placing a value. Donald Trump paid his son $5 a week for years. That was his allowance. He said, I want my son to understand the value of money because it didn't come easy. If you're going to live in financial peace, you must accept the process as part of a divine law. You're learning, you're gaining, you're becoming. Mm, so much I want to say about that. Let me, in fact, I want, I want to. I want to go back to that for a moment. We've got just a few moments. You don't have today everything God's going to give you. There's a process. If you can't handle $10 right, why are you trying to get 100 Let's work, because what you do with a dollar is what you do with 100 If you tri trivialize a dollar, you'll trivialize 100 Have you learned how to handle what God has given you? Have you learned how to protect it? Can you turn 100 to 125? If I gave you a $100 bill, every one of you, a $100 bill to death, say, come back next week and tell me what you did with it, would you come back with more? I think it ought to be with a benevolence requirement. I'm going to give you $200. I want you to come back next Monday and show me what you made with it. Wouldn't that be something? Mike, is that like God? That's exactly like God. <laughs> Remember those talents he distributed? 
And one guy didn't, he didn't lose it, but he didn't gain. And God was so angry over it, he took the one talent he had and gave it to a guy that was productive. If you're going to live in financial peace, in my, in my opinion, you should live within the salary you're making. Live on the salary you're making. Don't live on the salary you want to make. And when you go, when you buy on credit, you're living on the salary you hope to make. You're counting on tomorrow's income. Why should you live on the salary that you're making? And I would say try to live on 70%, 10% to God, 10% for your savings, 10% for investing. And uh, I, would, I, would, I would try to live on, seven, on, on 70 cents out of the dollar. And that's how the dollar that you're getting, you know, you're already getting the government about 25 or 35% or 40%. But try to live on the salary that you're making. Have the courage to downsize. Have the courage to downsize. My wife doesn't want to give up this house, but you can't afford it. If both of you work in 10, 12 hours a day, you have no time to enjoy life. You have no extra money to, to go on a vacation. You're living above your means. That's what the famous saying, but it is. Have the courage to downsize to your present salary. Why? When you live on credit, you're creating an illusion for yourself. You're living a falsehood. You're really living a falsehood. And, and you're living a lie. You're deceiving yourself. And it's not the real world. It's not the real life for yourself. And if you, gotta, you, know, if you just have to lie, don't lie to yourself. If you just have to lie, don't lie to you. Let's say you make 400 a week. You say, Mike, I can't do anything for it. If, if that's what you make, and you're forced to live on that, you'll become creative. But I go into stores all the time so you don't have to make a payment for a year. You can take this furniture home and not have to pay a thing. Do you think I'm that, do you think I'm not stupid to see the, the spider web in that? What person with any sense would do that? Nobody. They know once they get your name on the dotted line, they got you. Why do they do that? So you will spend the next five years' income in their store before you walk out. Once they lock into your next five years of income, you are their servant because the, the borrower is servant to the lender. Live within your income. Why? It increases your creativity. You'll find new methods to save, new motivation, new problems to solve, but you won't. The young couple that goes in and says, oh, you can do this. You don't have to pay and pay. The young couple just grabs it. Boy, we don't have to pay. <laughs> or you can buy all this for $30 a month. Shoot, that's a dollar a day. Let's do it. And a month later, they want something else, but they're locked in. They, they can't. And they're a servant. You want to live in financial peace? Downsize. Downsize. Mike, that, I thought we were supposed to be in a prosperity conference. We are. Learn how to do that. Learn how to do that. His mind is kept in perfect peace. His mind has stayed on him. There are men in this room, men that I know and love, that are trying to live too high. You don't have the income for what you're doing. You don't have the income for where you're living. I could buy a new car any day of the week, any car. But I want my money in my hand not a used car, somebody keys in the parking lot, and I'm stuck with a used car for the next five years. Do you follow me? I wouldn't buy a new car. You say, I like the new smell. Buy a $2.95 spray. <laughs> spray your present car. <laughs> Every feeling has a price. <laughs> Every feeling has a price. 60000 is too high for a feeling. Mike, you can say that because you've got people giving you new cars. I know. But you can buy a three-year-old car for half the price, and it'll be just as good as the day. They could run back the speedometer. You wouldn't know the difference. So all this is in the head. They're selling you a head job. 
They're selling you a head job. Downsize. Downsize the car. Downsize the house. And just look at it. Do it for 12 months. Do it for 90 days. Develop a passion for thriftiness, frugality. And that would be number six in my opinion. Develop a passion for frugality. Become frugal. I still negotiate everything. And I see things I could buy, but no, I still want to know the price. Can I get a better deal? <laughs> Can I get a better deal? Is there a better way to do this? Is there a cheaper way? Is there a more inexpensive way? Can I do it more economically? What can I do differently? All of your billionaires are money pinchers. Sam Walton's son said, Daddy, mother, mother and daddy just didn't like to spend money. Spending becomes addictive. I know. <laughs> Spending is addictive. It creates sensations. But you can create the same sensation for a lower price. You're kidding. No. You can spend $40 on a meal or $2 and still be full. And if you want to gain weight, you can gain it on $2. Right. And we just found out. You, we can, I take it to hamburger place right today. We can help you gain weight. For under three bucks. <laughs> In fact, probably do it on dollar Cheetos, Fritos. Develop a passion for thriftiness and frugality. If you want to prosper, don't think blessing in the sense of just having a lot of money to do things with. Think of what can I do at a better price. Seven. Was that... Uh, Yes, six, six was develop, I think, was develop a, a passion for, for frugality and thriftiness. And five was live, within your, with, live on your income. Yeah, live on your salary. And that won't always be. You won't have to stay small like that forever, but it makes you creative. Otherwise, you think you've got it when you're not. You're spending money on, that you hadn't made yet. Seven, I'm talking about living in peace, financial peace. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about living to impress somebody. And if you know some people you're trying to impress, you don't even like. Sometimes you don't, and they don't like you. And you bring people to your house to show it off, they'll have two reactions. I thought they'd have more. Or, huh, I wouldn't have it that way. I wouldn't have a house like that. I'd never spend that much on a house. Seven, stay in hourly obedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Stay in hourly obedience to the voice of the Spirit. His voice creates your peace. His voice is reassuring. His voice is comforting. I prayed a lot through the night last night because I said, I don't want anyone to leave this conference with turbulence in your spirit, with unrest, discontent. If you're going to live in financial peace, taste what you've got. Savor what you've got. Enjoy it. Taste it. Monica Melgar, who's been with me probably 15, 16 years, Precious, incredibly loyal team member. She used to work with Evangelist Tony McCrary in Philadelphia. Her father takes care of my pri private properties, my home. We were walking around my yard one day, and she says, Dr. Murdoch, now that God has blessed you, I'm going to be praying that you'll be able to enjoy it. <laughs> Whew, from the mouth of babes. I don't mean girls, I mean protege. <laughs> Babe's gone wild, huh? <laughs> Boy, did she ever nail me. Because I haven't yet really learned to enjoy my blessings. You're kidding, no? So busy teaching about them. How do you know? I buy chairs I never sit in. I have flowers I don't look at. I noticed this the other day. Just put in a beautiful, gorgeous new waterfall in my house. I call it the whole area Garden of Eden, flagstone, you know, and the, the brook and all that stuff. And, it just, and I got the electrical so I could work with my computer out there and just because you can tell I couldn't rest, so I had to work. And uh, 
I got it the other day and I was so agitated because I wasn't accustomed to tasting and savoring the present. It's like people buying a car. My neighbor had a Ferrari wanted me to buy and so I drove it around and it had almost no mileage on it. He said, because ever, for every 1,000 miles you put it on, I think it loses 100,000 value or 10,000, 20,000. They don't want to drive them because they lose value. Well, then why would you buy the cotton bacon car? It's like, it's like buying a TV, but don't play it. Don't. It is possible that you're not presently enjoying half of what you've got. It is possible that there's a lot you have you have not extracted the taste that's still there. You're buying more gum and you hadn't chewed the one that's in your pocket. You hadn't chewed the slice that's in your pocket. I know. If you'll stay sensitive to his voice, God will tell you, look what I've done for you. See the stars? See what I've done. One day God told me, said, stop bragging about what you created and study my creation. Instantly I saw leaves and rocks. Look what I've done. I want to stop there for a moment and taste. I want to see this. Is it possible that you have a wife you don't enjoy because of financial stress? Is it possible that you have children you don't enjoy because you're so busy working you can't talk? Is it possible? I went through my house the other day, and I've, I've got you know guest rooms where people can stay when they come, except I don't have a lot of guests. I said, why do I have these rooms? Are you like Brother Weiser, my dad's, one of my dad's deacons, who bought cat food by the boxes because it was on sale, but he didn't have a cat? Are you building garages and you don't have a car for them? If you're going to walk and live in financial peace, you're going to have to learn to enjoy what you have. Are you buying more books and had read the ones you got? God's dealing with me about this. God is dealing with me about this. My brother was telling me how they came over and wanted to sell us some properties around here and some things that are linked close. And I said, brother, we haven't even raised our present turf to its highest level of excellence. We hadn't even finished what we got. Let's, let's enjoy what we have. How will you do that? Listen to his voice. On this number seven, I'll close with this and we'll get more of it. The voice of God is really important. If he says don't buy it, don't buy it. If you feel hesitation, don't do it. I feel like peace is the signpost, not desire. I don't think passion is proof that you're supposed to have something. David had a passion to build a temple, but it was Solomon's job. I believe you can have misplaced passion. You that are married have found that your wife's not the only good thing you've noticed. Smile, fellas. I'm not going. We're not photographing here today. <laughs> desire, desire is not the confirmation that God wants you to have something. I want that. It must be God. Let your desires be purged in His presence. The greatest reward of His presence is that He purges your desires, and He gets them back in sequence. I've wanted wrong things more than one time in my life. I see things I can't have. What do you do? Shut your eyes, look another direction. <laughs> That's what you do before it gains momentum in your life. You can, you can want a piece of land and get addicted to that thing, and you've got to have it no matter what the cost, and you'll pay twice as much as you should. You need to listen to the tapes of Greg Plants and Christy Cole from this weekend. You need to listen to these CDs. You need to listen to them. Get them in your spirit. Listen to them when it gets in. Know God's voice. That's been a dominant thing. Know God's voice. Know his voice. When he tells you to sow, sow. 
When he tells you to give, to bless somebody, bless them. If he says, don't buy this, don't buy it. If he says, wait 24 hours like Randy White does in Florida, he doesn't buy, make a major purchase, still waits 24 hours. Let's taste. If you'll hear his voice, he'll help you taste what he's given you. He'll help you enjoy what he's already given you. Hadn't God been good to us? I said, hasn't God been good to us? How many want to live in financial peace, just peace? Does this help a little bit clear your mind up so you don't feel, you don't try to compare yourself. You don't try to compare yourself with everybody. Don't try to compare yourself with everybody. Don't. Stretch forth your hand toward me, you there to house. Thank you for staying over, and we're fixing to go into the uh, fixing. You can tell I'm Southern. We're going to go, go into the main service. But right there where you're living, where that's England, Singapore, Nigeria, just stretch forth your hand toward the computer right now. Let's just say this prayer aloud. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. I'm very appreciative, very, appreciative. Very, grateful very grateful for everything you've already given me. Kill any passion, any desire that's not of you. I will savor the present. And I will walk in financial peace. I will examine my own mistakes. I will learn from them. I will permit others to be accountable for their own decisions. I will live in financial peace. I will have the courage to downsize my life until you provide different methods of increase. You are my true source. My real estate, my rent houses, even my job is not my security. You are my security. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? I'm so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. 
call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.